In this lecture, we'll be looking at Chapter 12, Artistry in an Age of Industry, circa 1800 to 1900. And as usual, we're going to begin with the context. So at this time period, this is what's known as the Age of Revolution. We have the Scientific Revolution, which we've already talked about a little bit, um, where man is looking more towards knowledge and information that can be scientifically proven for the answers to the world. Also, um, in Europe, we have the French Revolution of 1789, and then the Napoleonic Wars of 1803 and 1815, where Napoleon be declared himself Emperor of Western Europe. Also, directly before this, at the end of the 1700s, we of course had the American Revolution. The American Revolution was one of the first times where a colony had successfully overthrown the empire and established itself as a new country. This greatly influenced the French Revolution. Um, from your history, France actually supported the United States and the American Revolution. What happens in the French Revolution, it's a little bit different than the American Revolution. Here what we have, it's more of a class distinction and a class revolution. And what you see is you see the middle and the lower classes actually throwing off the aristocracy. And in fact, Louis the Sixteenth was... Um, decapitated by the people of France and eventually Marie Antoinette, his wife was. And so we have a period of time where the monarchy was disestablished within the French world. Also very important, this is the time of the Industrial Revolution. Now this began in Britain, it spread to France and then the rest of Europe and eventually to the Americas. Now this is very important because we're, what we're going to see here is the rise of industry and technology and a change in the manufacturing process. What happens is factories start to develop and what happens in a factory is that you can produce mass produce products quickly and cheaper. You have to think up to, mo to this time most people how they lived their lives were some sort of a farmer. When you farm, you work, your day starts when the sun comes up, and you work as late as you can. There's the saying, make hay while the sun shines, that refers to this way of life. Also, when you're farming, for a long time, these were very individualistic. So on the farm, you produced what you needed to survive. Well, what happens with the Industrial Revolution is that these products where people had been reliant on themselves to get them, well, you can now get them very quickly, very easily, and at a much cheaper cost. So, for example, instead of having to spend days creating candles, you could just go buy these candles. And so because of this, we see more and more factories arise. More people then are moving to the cities. We're going to see the rise of the cities at this time because they're going and they're working in these factories. And very important at this time, we see the development of what's called clock time. You have to think about this. Before this time period, right, when you were a farmer, when did you work when the sun came up? Well, when you work in a factory, if, when do you work? Well, your scheduled shift. So if you're supposed to be there from 8 to 9, you need to know when it's 8 o'clock. And it's during this time period that the clock became the main way that humans tracked time. Now, at the beginning of this time period, with the rise of industry, we actually see a rise in the economic status for most everyone. Again, we see this rising middle class, and also because of the rise of the cities based off the Industrial Revolution, we're actually going to see a rise in arts, especially the theater, because, say you're working till 5, well, once you're done working, you no longer have to go home and do all these things you used to have to do. So people wanted some form of entertainment. So we're going to see the rise of the arts, especially in the theater. Now, near the end of the 1800s, we're going to see that these working conditions had largely deteriorated. Um, many factory workers then did get taken advantage of. This is also the time of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, who developed the idea of Marxism. This idea was to help the workers, and what they did is they developed the basic, they said the workers developed the basic tenets of socialism. Socialism means the means of products, are, means of production are owned by society, and the property should also be owned by all individuals. 
This is also the time of Charles Darwin, 1809 and 1882, and his idea of natural selection in the origin of species, which was published in 1859. Sigmund Freud developed psychoanalysis that deals with the unconscious mind. And then art during this time period no longer depended on patronage, meaning classically when we had an artist, they'd have to have some sort of wealthy patron who would support them. Well, art almost became its own independent industry, and artists actually tried to avoid having to work for a patron. And then in Asia, we're going to see Japan beginning to open to international pay, uh, trade. Japan had wanted to be seen as a modern country, but for years, and I mean centuries, it had actually closed its doors. It didn't want to have anything to do with the Western world. And because of this, Japan began to be seen as kind of backwards and behind. And what happens is Japan does not want to be left behind in the modern age. So they begin to open their doors, and how they uh, do this to make themselves look more modern is that they began, began to look very, very Western. In fact, if you look at buildings of this time period, um, they have a very strong Western influence, and especially the military. In fact, there are images of the military in Japan that you would think were either British or American, is how they were looking. In Africa, in the 19th century, the exploration and colonization of Africa by Europeans continue, and there was this attempt to Christianize and civilize the savages or the barbarians that were there continues. In the Americas, as I've already stated, at the end of the 1700s, the America, America established itself as a sovereign company or country. Um, in the 1800s, America achieves manifest destiny, which is the idea that it was the Americans' God-given duty to explore um, and claim all the worlds to the all the lands to the west. And then we see the exploitation of Native Americans and slaves continue. In 1823, President Monroe declares the Monroe Doctrine, which basically um, was America closing its borders, saying that this country is an established country and any attempts to colonize it will be seen as an act of aggression and therefore an act of war. And this was a very um, bold statement for such a young country. Also, as I said earlier, industrialization works its way to the United States. And what happenings, happens with this, it actually created, um, it helped widen the gap between the North and the South. The North became very urban and industrialized, while the South remained agrarian and dependent on the plantation economy. With the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860, southern states began to secede, and the Civil War breaks out from 1861 to 1865. So that's your context, that's your overview of what's going on in the world. Now for this lecture, these are the artistic styles I want you to know. Romanticism, Realism, Aestheticism, Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, and the Art Nouveau. Now we'll begin with Romanticism. What happens in the idea of Romanticism is it's based somewhat on the ideas of the philosopher Immanuel Kant. And what happens in the late 18th century, he claimed there is a noble world of sense and perceptions and an unknowable world of the essence. He said the real world is a mental reconstruction of the ideal world. Thus, reality is actually found in the mind. This idea is also called Romanticism. Now, when we think romanticism, don't just think romantic love. It's not all hearts, puppies, kittens, and unicorns. However, romanticism does focus more on the emotions. And what happens because of this, this was actually a reaction to the rationalism of the previous times. In romanticism, we're going to see a celebration of individualism, the imagination, free expression, feeling, and then communication with nature were all valued within this. The artists were not most often not trying to represent the world with exact honesty or um, realistically, but what was more important in romantic works is usually the message and the meaning behind the works themselves. And then very important is this role of nature, and we'll talk about this more. It's the role of what's called the sublime. The artist was seen as a visionary genius who possesses the ultimate insight into fundamental reality and could reveal this insight to others through their works. 
Now again, artworks did not have to be perfect, meaning no idealized perfection, but often they were more important about the message and the meaning. So we're going to begin with painting. Painting in the Romantic tri strives for freedom from social and artistic rules. Expressive intent ruled over formal content, and works played with line and color to affect the viewer. Now the work we're going to see here, this is Jean-Auguste Dominique in Grace, and this is the Grande Odalesca, otherwise known as a harem girl. It's an oil on canvas 1814. And this work is actually more of a transitional work, moving from the neoclassic to the romantic. Because again, we see those very crisp, clear lines and the color palette of the neoclassical, yet the subject matter is much more romantic. And I would even argue this actually has some manneristic qualities to it. If we look at her spine, look at how long that spine is, and then even look at the proportion between the two legs. So this is kind of more of a transitional painting. Now, one of the probably the most important artists to the Romantic movement is Francisco de Goya. He was a Spanish artist, uh, 1746 to, six, to 1828. And what we see here within his works is his works, he tried to capture again the emotions of a moment. And we can see that in this image here. This is not in your book. However, this is Yard with Lunatics, 1794, and it's an oil on tin plated iron. And what happens with this is de Goya had spent much of his life, he was um, a painter for the Spanish king, but at one point in his life he actually became very ill and he went deaf. And because of this, at this moment, after he became deaf, his works took on a much darker um, point of view. And we're going to see that in works such as this, because you have to remember at the time if you were hearing impaired, that was considered an illness, and you could actually be put in an insane asylum. And that's what we see here, that in this work, it's a reflection of his own fears of what his life may turn out to be. And so as you study this painting, you can see very dark. We definitely do not have the clean lines of the neoclassical. In fact, many of the edges are blurred. And as you study this, it's very dark, right? And the only place of light is actually outside the yard, either to the heavens or the outside free world. Also, many romantic works took on a political message, um, and we see that in this work by Francisco de Goya. This is the execution of the citizens of Madrid, the 3rd of May, 1808. This was painted in 1814, and it's an oil on canvas. And what he's doing here, and in this work, he's actually attacking both the Spanish and the French government. What happens here is this is showing an event that actually occurred, but it's not showing it realistically. Okay, so when we look at this, what happened is part of the Napoleonic Wars, um, Napoleon's troops were in Madrid. The citizens of Madrid fought back against them. Well, the next day, in retaliation to the citizens of Madrid fighting back, the leaders of the Napoleonic army said, okay, we're going to take all of the captives that we have, and we're going to take them outside the city walls, and we're going to execute them. And that's what you see here. So this is an actual event that happened, yet he's changed it somewhat to add to that emotion, to the drama of it. Now this painting at the time period was considered very, very gory. If you look, we actually have three moments. We have on the left-hand bottom, we have the dead, in the man, the man in the white shirt, we have the dying, and then you can see the line of citizens waiting in line to be executed. Now, this work, again, it's created this way, it's composed this way to create drama. The light source only seems to be coming from this box lantern here, yet how it's projecting light is not realistic. The man in the center with his arms thrown out is wearing a bright white shirt. He is a focal point, so our eyes go straight to him. And how he's standing, he's supposed to represent a Christ-like figure, that basically he is an innocent man. Yet, part of the critique of the government, he's not an innocent man dying for the sins of humanity. He's dying for the sins of the government. Also, what's unrealistic in this is look at the firing squad. They would not be this close to the citizens. Why does he put them this close? Because it adds that emotion, that drama to the effect. 
So within this, again, making a social and emotional statement and not trying to be strictly representational. All right, another artist of the Romantic period is J.M.W. Turner, um, it's 19, 1775 to 1851. He was an English artist, well known for watercolors, but he also worked with oils, and he's often known as the painter of light. And what's important within his works is he says that truth is what was felt in the idea of the sublime. Now this is where we're going to talk about the role of nature. The idea of the sublime is that nature is a powerful force that must be respected and that man should not assume that his dominance of it. And we're going to see this in many of the works of Turner. And this is a reflection of the time because you got to think up until this point, scientific discoveries, man is using nature more and more to support um, his own ideas. Well, in the Romanticism, they say, no, nature is there, right? Nature is to be respected because man thinks we're in control, but then events happen and we're not. Um, for example, all the hurricanes that happened in the past hurricane season, we can see how devastating nature can be. And I often say in my classes, you know, this is your Jurassic Park moment. Man thinks he has control, but nature finds a way. And we see that in this image here. This is rain, steam, and speed, the Great Western Railway. And what we see here is we actually see a train crossing the River Thames. Um, this is in 1844, and it's an oil on canvas. And here what we're looking at, it's almost nature versus the machine. We see the train coming across. If you look closely in the bottom right-hand corner, there's actually a little rabbit on the tracks trying to get out of the way. And then it's going over the water. And if you look in the lower left hand, you can see men fishing. Now, when you look at this, it's very blurry. And that was done very intentional because he wanted the viewer to understand the rate of speed. Because the trains at this time would go about 35 miles per hour. For us, that doesn't seem very quick, but at that time period, it was very, very fast. And he wanted the viewer to experience this. Interestingly enough, there's a story of how he actually experienced this, was he was riding on the train, and he stuck his head out the window so he could get that feeling of the wind going through. And then also, if you look up in the sky, it seems almost dirty. Well, the clouds are obscured from the steam and the smoke from the engine itself. This painting is Fisherman at Sea, 1796, and it's an oil on canvas. These are all, of the next couple will be by Turner. Now within this one, we see the idea of the sublime. However, this is not nature violently taking control, right? This is just nature um, in a calm setting. What we see here is fishermen going out to ply their trade early morning when they go out to fish, yet you see the smallness of them within the vastness of nature. Now this painting, The Burning of the House of Lords and Commons, 1834-1835, this is also an oil on canvas. This is actually also depicting an event that occurred in um, 1834 when the Houses of Parliament, right, the Houses of Lords and Commons, literally the seat of the English government, caught on fire and burned. And you can see here, this is that idea of the sublime, right? Standing in the front of nature and realizing you are not in control, that nature is in control. And we can see here on the left, right, the burning, the fire raging. And what's the only thing man can do? Man can just sit there and watch. If you look all along the, the top of the um, bridge, you see people standing there. All the little dots in the foreground are people standing. And even when you look in the water, there's boats with people in them. And all they can do is just sit there and watch as nature literally destroys the seat of government. Now this will be the last um, painting we look at by Turner. This is called Slavers Throwing Overboard the Dead and Dying Typhoon Approaching. This is often known as the slave ship. 1840 oil on canvas and this is actually in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston so if you ever get there go look at this. Now what's happening in this? Again he's making a very political statement in here. Again we see those characteristics of the romantic not clear crisp clean lines not trying to be strictly representational but the political comment he's making in here 
Is this what he's showing is a practice that actually occurred? And this is talking about the slave trade. And what would happen is when ships would pick up slaves from Africa, as soon as they were on the ship, they were considered property. And they would bring them over to wherever they're going to sell them. And we all know from our history classes what type of conditions those were. Many slaves would die or be sick. Well, what would happen is before the boats would dock, what they would do is any of the slaves that would die, they would just bury them at sea. So once the ships dock, you are then going to sell the slaves. Well, if you have a sick slave, is that going to sell for much money? No. So the practice was what they would do is the sick slaves, they would actually also throw them overboard so they would drown. Therefore, the ship owners could claim they had died and they could claim the insurance money, which would be more money than they would get than if they tried to sell a sick, sick slave. And that's what he's showing within this work. If you look, we see the ship in the, in the left, but look in the foreground. We see these hands and these feet sticking out of the water. And if you look closely, you can still see the shackles and the chains on them. Now think about this. This is not representational because if you were thrown in water with heavy shackles and sh chains, what would happen? You would sink. Well, why is he showing these hands sticking out of the water with the chain still on them? It's supposed to be so the viewer can see and understand what's going on and understand the horridness of this situation. And then also, if you look in the right foreground, you're going to see kind of a swarm. And what we see is we see the fish and the birds actually eating um, the bodies of the dead and the not yet dead in the water. So again, this is meant to be a political statement. All right, moving on to literature. Um, romantic English literature began in about the 1790s, and most of them used Shakespeare as a role model. Here we're going to see probably the most popular of the romantic um, literature forms is the romantic poetry. William Wordsworth, 1770 to 1850, described poetry as the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. And he found a world of beauty through nature and harmony and the harmony between man and nature. In his lyrical ballads, one of his most famous works is a celebration of nature. Other famous poets at the time, Samuel Taylor Coolridge, um, William Blake, and then what's considered the high point of English romantic poetry included Lord Byron, John Keats, and Percy Bysshe Shelley. Um, Lord Byron often wrote very energetic verse and used rhyme schemes to express different moods, such as She Walks in Beauty from 1814, which I have on the slide for you. Um, he also would write about a hero, Don Juan, who was a natural man. And all Don wanted was love, and his life was a struggle against the hardship of civilization. It showed the brutality, the hypocrisy, and the conventionality of society standards. Byron himself was actually a man to, who lived in excess, and if you want to hear, um, if you're looking for an interesting poet to write about, I highly recommend looking into him. Um, John Keats, poetry, very vivid imagery, sensuous appeal, um, his expression of philosophy through classical legends, and he would like to confront the conflicting impulses of the inner being with the wider world surrounding him. Probably one of his most famous works is the Ode on a Grecian Urn, an Ode to a Nightingale. And then we have Percy Bysshe Shelley. And here, this is the Shelley uh, Memorial. Percy Bysshe Shelley was actually married to Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. Um, she actually wrote, she was author, also an author, and she wrote Frankenstein. Her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, was well known. She wrote A Vindication of the Rights of Women in 1792, where she argued that women were not inferior to men, but were kept so because they were not educated. Mary Wollstonecraft actually died giving birth to Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. But again, Mary Shelley educated and wrote Frankenstein, the original title of the modern Prometheus. Well, she marries Percy Bysshe Shelley. Percy Bysshe Shelley wrote in a more meditative and lyrical vein, and his poetry and pose output remained pretty steady through his life, but most publishers and journals refused to publish his works for fear of being arrested themselves for blasphemy and sedition, meaning causing others to riot. 
His poems reflect his passionate search for personal love and social justice. Now this is the Shelley Memorial at the University College of Oxford. Interestingly enough that it's there because he was actually expelled from Oxford, Oxford for writing The Necessary of Atheism. And what we see here is Shelley actually drowned in a boating accident with it when he was 30. But there is some speculation over this of whether it was actually an accident because he and two other men, the other two men who were um, seafaring individuals, um, all drowned and it looked like their boat maybe had been rammed. Now there's the story that when their bodies, when these victims washed up on shore, they would have the funeral prior right there. Why? Because they didn't want to bring these bodies back into the public in case there was disease. Now women at the time were still not allowed to attend funerals because it was seen as they were too delicate so it, was, it would offend their sensibilities. Well, the story is that as Shelley's body um, is burning on the funeral pyre, um, that Mary Shelley shows up and she reaches into the flames and takes his heart out. And so there was the, the legend that she had the ashes of his heart. Well, interestingly enough, years and years later, they actually found... Um, after her daughter-in-law had passed away, Mary Shelley had already passed away, after her daughter-in-law passed away, there's the rumor that they were going through her possessions, and they found an envelope, and it said Shelley, and there were ashes in it. So people think that was uh, Piercy Bicey Shelley's heart. All right, your text also talks about Jane Austen, 1775 to 1817, as a romantic writer, but actually she was probably more of a realist than a romantic. Her works often celebrate and find joy in the day-to-day -day life, in the ordinary. Her works explore the human experience, and in most works uses some humor to do this. Examples of this are Emma from 1815. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, Emma has been, many of her works are still remade into modern classics. So Emma was remade, um, a modern me remake of it was Clueless. All right, and then moving on to the romantic music. Again, this was an opportunity to express emotion. However, romantic music actually was not a great leap from classical music. It was more of a gradual uh, progression. We do find an emphasis on the beautiful, the lyrical, and expressive melodies. Emotional conflict was suggested by juxtaposition of different meters and rhythmic irregularities. Often we would find very colorful harmonies that were used. Again, this was meant to excite the emotions. Now, established rules or laws of composition were often disregarded to achieve these striking emotional effects. Dissonance, which is a lack of harmony, was often used again for this emotional response. And then also what became important was the leader or the lead or the art song. Now this was written for a solo voice with piano accompaniment along with a poetic text. And that's what I have for you here. This actually is a poem called Der Elfling or The Elf King 18. Um, the poem was written by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe in 1782. However, what happens with this is that we have Franz Schubert um, took this poem and he transforms it into a musical number. And so you can hear the poem being sung, but the music itself actually accompanies it. Um, and what happens in this is the story tells of an anxious young boy who's being carried home at night by his father on horseback. And what happens is the boy, this elf king, is chasing them trying to get the boy. And the boy is very frightened. And within the poem, we hear three different voices. We have the boy crying to his father for help. We have the father trying to comfort the boy. And then we have Der Elkling, or the Elf King, talking to the boy. So please listen to this YouTube clip. It's not very long. And just, it's, I gave you the German version of it, but I just want you to listen to it so you can feel and understand that emotion. All right. Um, Skim pages 327 to 332 in the Romantic Music, but here's just a couple highlights. Piano works became very important due to advances in piano design. Uh, Frédéric Chopin was Polish, but he lived in France, and he wrote almost exclusively for the piano. And what I have for you here, the clip, is this what's called an etude. And this is a piece to help a performer master a specific talent. And so each etude actually explores a single problem. 
What you have here is um, revolutionary. It's the etude in C minor, um, op 10. And what this is, the idea behind it is most um, people were right-handed. And so when you play the piano, the right hand was much stronger. Well, the point of this one is actually to help develop speed and strength in the left hand. So watch this video, and you can watch as she's playing, almost exclusively she plays with the left hand. Program music also became very popular again during this time period. And remember, program music was music that developed around a non-musical idea. Usually, it's usually telling some sort of story. And probably one of the most famous of this is Berloitz's Symphony Fantastique from 1830. Now, this was written about a hero who actually poisoned himself because of an unrequited love. But the poison actually doesn't kill him, but it causes him to have all these visions, including a ball, a pastoral scene, a dream where he actually kills his beloved, and he is then sent to the scaffolding and hung. And then final is a witch's Sabbath. And here I've also included a section. And I want you to listen to this and think about um, what section this actually is. I'm not going to spoil it for you. It's the witch's Sabbath. All right, um, symphonies, many romantic symphonies followed classical forms, such as Brahms' Symphony No. 3 in F major from 1883. And then a newer trend is we're actually going to see the rise of folk songs. Examples of this is going to be the Russian composer, composer Tchaikovsky, 1840 to 1893. And here I've included in his very famous 1812 overture, and he also wrote the Nutcracker Ballet. All right, opera began again um, to be very, very popular at this time. These grand operas developed. These were staged, spectacular productions, crowded scenery, ballet, um, extreme music, excessive um, costuming. And again, they were supposed to elicit the, this romance within them. Now, theater at the time, interesting enough, the romantic ideas of freedom of form did not translate very well into the theater because many of the 19th century playwrights wrote completely unstageable scripts. In this refusal to conform to the limits of the stage, they, their productions, therefore, were not able to actually be put on. All right, and then very important to this movement is the ballet. When we talk about the classical ballet, we are talking about the romantic ballet. Now, the idea in ballet is that beauty was truth and that dance compromised visual simulation to show beautiful forms and graceful attitudes. Dancing was seen like a living portrait or a sculpture that combines the physical pleasure and feminine beauty. Now, the central role of the Romantic Ballet belonged to the ballerina. The ballerina, light, graceful, dressed in flowing tool. And when you look at ballet, it's supposed to look easy, effortless, raised up from the floor. When in fact, ballet is very, very specific and it's very, very technically difficult to do. Um, most ballet is performed on point, meaning on the toes, and most... Um, you have to have years of training before you ever actually begin to dance on point. Very specific down to even the placement of the hands and the fingers. And this is why actually a lot of modern day athletes, especially boxers and um, football players, wide receivers, take ballet because it teaches you how to control every single part of your body. Now the objectives of the Romantic Ballet were to show the delicate ballerinas, lightly poised, costumed in soft tool, moving on point with grace and elegance. And you're going to see this in the example I give for you here, which is La Silphide, 1832, and it was the most famous of the Romantic Ballets. Now here what you're watching is watch for the ballerina's lightness, delicacy, and modest grace establish the standard for romantic ballets of the time. Again, romantic ballets, you, they would tell a story, but almost always without any spoken word. So everything had to be told through the dance and through the music itself. This is also the time when Swan Lake was first produced in 1877 and The Nutcracker in 1892.
Now the two clips I have for you here, again the one is from La Sylphide, um, and then the other one is from the Black Swan from Swan Lake. And what this is, the second one's very short, and that's just showing the foyate, which is the whipping turn that is popular to this day. And again, you can see the technical difficulty within this. And then finally in architecture, we're, or I'm sorry, finally in romanticism, we're going to look at architecture. Now this, we don't really have a specific um, attributes we can talk about because this again was a time of discovery and trial. We are having new technological advancements that are being used and because of this it led to exploration. Some of these new materials included iron, steel, glass, being able to be manipulated in a way that they were useful for architecture. And this is best seen in London's Crystal Palace of 1851, which I'm showing you um, a drawing of it. This was moved later, and then it was actually destroyed by fire in 1936. All right, now we're going to move on to realism. Realism developed in the mid-19th century, and it was in a way a reaction to Romanticism, but more so it was almost a reaction to the invention of the camera, and the idea when the camera was first developed, pun intended, was that it, the camera offered an exact representation of the world. Well, what happens in painting is we're going to see that painting sought to make an objective and unprejudiced record. And we're going to see this, sorry, I'll go back to this one, in works such as this one. This is Gustave Colbert's The Stonebreakers of 1849. And what he is painting, what we see in realism, is in a way this depiction of trying to show the world as it is. This is how he found these men, and he painted them exactly as he found them. This is also what's called social realism, meaning part of the idea of this was to draw attention to the everyday conditions of the working classes and the poor. This was often a critique on the conditions that kept these individuals in their economic positions in societies. And what we see here is these men, their job is literally to break apart stones. I mean, this is literally back-breaking work. Yet what he's doing by showing them as their su his subject matter is he's giving them, he's almost elevating them, showing the grace and the usefulness in works such as this. Now this work, Edouard Monet, Manet, not Monet, don't confuse them, what he strove was to paint only what the eye can see. Yet he believed that painting allowed this to be seen in a way that was different from photography and that the painting reflect his own impressions. And we're going to see later that this um, was highly influential to the style of Impressionism. Now Manet found romantic themes to be superficial, and often in his work to use harmonious colors and subjects from everyday life. He liked to use actual light and weather and not e idealize what was going on. And he strove to speak with a new voice. And what we're seeing here, this painting is commonly known as The Picnic from 1863. Now this shocked the public when it was first displayed. It was seen as an immoral, naked frolic in a public Parisian park. And here, what's interestingly enough, is he was playing around with different things. He was actually recreating two very famous different scenes. We can see, look at the man's outstretched hand. This is actually a rec recreation of Michelangelo's The Creation of Adam from the Sistine Chapel ceiling and Raphael's The Judgment of Paris. It obviously takes imagery from these two works. However, this was totally lost on the public at large because all they could focus on was the naked woman um, with the two closed men in a public area obviously making eye contact with us. All right, theater and literature and realism. Theater, um, one of the most famous playwrights is Anton Chekhov, uh, Russian, 1860 to 1904, and he's considered the founder of modern realism. His plays were about daily life and had accurate representations of frustrations and the depressing nature of existence. And you can see this in 1897's Uncle Vanya, which explores the aimlessness and hopelessness of human existence. We also see this in the works of George Bernard Shaw. He was an Irish playwright, 1856 to 1950. His works, though, were more humanitarian. He tended to have faith in people and their potential. His plays often deal with the unexpected. 
Now he was opposed to this idea of art for art's sake that we're going to talk about in a second. And Shaw insisted that art should have a purpose. And many of his plays carried a social message and he believed that they were more effective than the political writings of the time. Also in the theater and literature at the time, we're going to stress naturalism, which is close to realism, but it states that hereditary environment and environment determine a person's behavior. Now the literature at the time is also the same idea. It, the literature stressed that art and the literature should depict life with absolute honesty, show things as they really are. Often in these works, you're going to see very specific details and historical accuracy and personal objective interpretations, and this was very polar to Romanticism. What happens in many of the works try to convey their moral value system and judgment on others. And you're going to see that in works such as the one I have here. This is Crime and Punishment by Fedor Dostoevsky, um, 1821 to 1881, Russian writer. And what he wrote about is that he, he claimed that humans require penance and that salvation comes through suffering. And he believed that materialism led to decadence and decline. And you see this discussed in Crime and Punishment from 1866. This is a psychological novel. We're going to talk, see many different personalities in it. And basically it's looking at when we first meet different characters, we think we know who the good person is and who the bad person is. Well, we see what happens when good people basically are forced to do very bad things. In fact, our protagonist actually commits a murder. Um, throughout the text, there is a woman who is a prostitute, and we think of her as the immoral character, yet we also find out why she has to do what she does. And you see that all explored within the works of Crime and Punishment. All right, now the next movement we're going to look at is very, very quickly, and this is what's called aestheticism. This is in the 19th century, and this is also, you're going to hear I me, and I've said this before, the term art for art's sake. Well, what happens with the aesthetics is that they believed art needs no other reason than to be beautiful, that it does not have to serve any other purpose. I mean, we've spent, you know, hours talking and reading about all the different things that art can do. You know, romanticism, political message, stirring the emotions. Aestheticism says no. Basically, quit putting all this stuff on art. All art has to do is be aesthetically pleasing, meaning it just needs to be beautiful. It does not need to serve any other purpose. And we see this, um, one of the first lectures we watched or listened to when we talked about what is art, there was a quote from Oscar Wilde that says, all art is quite useless. And that's from the preference of Dorian Gray. And that's exactly what he was saying, that it's quite useless, meaning it doesn't have to have a purpose, that art should not be the vehicle for social and political messages. All right, the next artistic style we're going to look at is Impressionism. Now, Impressionism, many people are very familiar with this artistic movement, but interestingly enough, it was actually a very short-lived movement. It only lasted from the 1870s into the 1880s, and it, served, um, and it focused lar largely in France. In fact, the Impressionists were a group of artists who got together and worked together and then would often exhibit their work together. Now what Impressionism focuses on is it's a new way of expressing reality. And in fact, the term Impressionism was actually coined by a critic and was meant to be insulting. The critic was Louis Leroy, and he was looking at this image here. This is Monet's Impression Sunrise from 1872. And when he looked at it, he said, that's not a sunrise, that's just an impression of a sunrise. And basically Monet was like, thank you, because that's exactly what he was trying to show. So within painting and Impressionism, um, and that's what Impressionist artists are mainly known for is, is painting, we'll look at one sculpture, but for the most part, painting. And what Impressionist artists were trying to do is they sought to capture the psychological perception of reality in color and motion. Now they did see themselves in competition with the camera, but not by trying to present the world as it actually was, but by trying to portray the essentials of perception. And what the Impressionists were doing is they were capturing a moment, the impression of a single moment. 
The Impressionists were very interested in the effect of natural light on objects and atmosphere. And again, they had a profoundly different vision of the world. They saw themselves as seeing a new way of rendering this vision onto canvas. The paintings were typically pretty small. Many Impressionist artists use very bright colors. The composition is casual and natural and usually very open. And again, it was the idea of capturing this fleeting moment. They also tended to focus on subject matter of the everyday. And you'll see in works such as Monet's, Claude Monet, who we're looking at here, very famous for work such as his water lilies. And you would see painting after painting after painting of things such as the water lilies. He also has a whole series of haystacks. And what he would do is he would go out to the same location and he would paint the same scene but at different times a day. Why? Because how the natural light plays on the, on the works changed the perception of that moment. Also, the Impressionist artists were one of the first ones to go out and paint on air, meaning they literally would take their easel and their canvases out into the open world and just paint right there. Many times, artists would go and they would go study the world, but then they would go back into their studios to create the works. Impressionist artists, most, for the most part, wouldn't do this. They would actually go paint on air. Also, most times when you are prepping a canvas to be painted on, artists will paint a dark color in the background and then paint the other colors on it. Well, most Impressionist artists would actually paint their canvases white and then paint on top of that. So again, the Impressionists trying to see the world in the new way, trying to just capture the impression of a moment. You'll also see these very loose, open brush strokes. We can clearly see, um, we're back on Impression Sunrise, we can clearly see in the water, right? The clear brush strokes. And then things are kind of, if you will, smooshy in the background. We can tell there's some ships in the city, but it's not clearly defined, such as realistic works. Also, in a lot of Impressionist works, you're going to see a thicker application of paint. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen an Impressionist work, but the further away you stand from them, it's easier to depict what they are. Once you get closer and closer to the work, they almost kind of break up into the individual brush strokes. And again, Claude Monet is probably the most famous of the Impressionistic artists. Next, we have Pierre-Auguste Renoir, 1841 to 1914, and this is the dance at Les Moulins de la Guette, and this is 1876, and it is in oil on canvas. Again, what Renoir was very interested in is showing just the normal, the everyday. He specialized in portraying the human form and showing what was beautiful in the body. He did this in both painting and sculpture. Now again, there's a casualness and an open com composition into the work that invites the viewer in. And what he tried to show was he tried to show in works such as this one, the good life. Not necessarily of the aristocracy and the upper classes, but of the comfortable middle class. And that's what you're going to see here. This is just a Parisian street on a Sunday afternoon, and you can see all these individuals kind of just enjoying it. Now when you look at it again, we see that very loose brushwork, and when you take a closer work, there's really not any solid color fields within this work at all. Um, so the gentleman whose back is to us in the bottom left hand corner, it looks like it's a black jacket, but when you look closer, it's actually made up of lots of blues and browns. And then again, you see this play of the natural light within the work. The individuals in the left foreground, they look almost speckled. It's because they're sitting under a tree. And he's actually showing on a bright sunny day how the light would look shining through the tree. Now the Impressionist artists were open to having women artists as part of their group, and this one here is one you should be familiar with. It's the cover of your textbook. This is Berta Morazas um, in the dining room, 1875, oil on canvas. Now again, she was a female artist, and often she was more introspective and often focused more on the family and individuals. What we see here though is very interesting in the dining room actually shows a serving girl as the focus of the work. Now we've seen servants in works before, but usually they're more supplementary characters. They're in the background. Think of the different um, Olympia or Venus of Urbino. 
we see servants but they're in the background here the servant the serving girl is the focus of our attention and she also boldly stares back at the viewer now you have to remember servants were people who were often overlooked in society well here we have to look at her not as an object just to be viewed but she is a subject she is the subject of the work and her bold look at us um, her bold stare at us makes us see that also, you can see in here again, the very loose, very open brushwork. Um, also interesting in this, look in the lower right foreground and we see another dog. Again, I mentioned earlier in the semester that usually when dogs are shown in paintings, it's meant to portray loyalty, especially when it's portrayed with a man and a woman. It's supposed to be loyal and fidelity from the woman. Think back to the Renaissance work, the Arnolfini marriage. Well, here it's kind of interesting because it's just her. And so the idea is, well, who does she ha have to be loyal to? And some scholars have said, well, you know, whoever she's working for, or some scholars look at it as more of a almost a feminist piece saying, well, she doesn't have to be loyal to anyone but herself. All right, again, I did mention that there were, um, what impressionistic works, painting is probably the most popular, but it does translate into other forms. This is a work by Auguste Rodin. Um, for those of you who have been on U of L's campus, you should be very familiar with this sculpture. This is the thinker from 1910, bronze, um, the one we have on L's campus in front of Grawmeyer Hall, interestingly enough, from the original mold, there were nine different sculptures cast. We have, after the original, we have the first one, and we have the only one that was made using the lost wax technique, which you can see that little video um, in the sculpture chapter. Now again here, in the, in the sculpture, we don't see those clear, distinct lines. Think of Michelangelo's David. And in fact, if you look at the thinker, he appears almost kind of lumpy. Well, the idea of that is to show almost those loose brush strokes that we see in the painting. We see that transformed into the sculpture itself. Often in sculpture, the use of texture and light to give the work the dramatic qualities. Okay. The work is much more realistic than the paintings, but it's still not fully representational. All right, and then we also have Impressionistic music. This was very anti-romantic, and what the Impressionist composers did is they turned more to symbolists, symbolists of the poets for inspiration. Probably one of the most famous Impressionistic composers is Claude Debussy. Interestingly enough, he actually didn't like to be called an Impressionist, and he sought no association with the movement. However, he gets classified this way because his work seemed to reflect many of the same ideas. Often what he wanted to base his music on was natural scenes, and he wanted to capture the effects of shimmering light in music. And you see that in the clip I have here, which is Claire de Lune. Um, composed for the piano. Now, of course, the modern-day artist Claire de Lune takes her name from this original composition. What Debussy wanted to do was he wanted to return French music to sources in nature. He abandoned cordial harmonies, and then many of his works have an oriental influence. And the clip I have for you here is Claire de Lune. Please take a minute and listen to it, and then see if you can understand how he's trying to talk about the light of the moon. Also, interesting enough, Disney, in one of the Fantasia films, this has also been illustrated. All right, impressionistic literature. What we focus on here, something that's new, is what was called the stream of consciousness. Now, this is a style of writing that reflects the human mind. It attempts to capture the fullness, the speed of the human mind, often interrupting thoughts and free association. Think about how your brain works. When you're just kind of sitting there going about your day and you're thinking about all this, like, okay, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. Oh, squirrel, shiny. Oh, yeah, what about this? That's what this stream of consciousness does, is that these writers were actually trying to show the inner workings of the human mind. Probably the two most well known for this, the man on the left, is James Joyce, 1882 to 1941, Irish writer. Um, one of his famous works is Ulysses, which is a modern parallel to Homer's Odyssey. However, Ulysses is a massive text, yet all the action takes place on a single day in Dublin, June 16, 1904. 
and he uses this stream of consciousness. And so we switch from character to character and we're inside their mind and we hear their inner workings. The woman on the right is Virginia Woolf, 1882 to 1941. She also would use the stream of consciousness in her works. Often her works would be focused around moments of experience, usually dealing with personal internal conflict. Um, she often would turn away from traditional characters and plots and talk about things such as um, women's uh, internal anguish and women's suffering. Now, Wolfe herself was an advocate for women's rights, and you see this in her 1929 work, A Room of One's Own. This is where she kind of takes up Mary Wollstonecraft's ideas in the vindication of, of rights of women, and she argues that women should also be educated as men, and they should have the same opportunities. If they do, then we would able, be able to see women writers who are as prolific as the men writers. All right. Um, here's an example I want to give you. This is from Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, and this gives you an example of that idea of stream of consciousness. Now, this is just one paragraph, and what's happening is the main character is literally getting ready to cross the street. Such fools we all are, she thought, crossing Victoria Street, for heaven only knows why one loves it so, how one sees it so, making it up, building it, round one, tumbling it, creating it every moment afresh. But the various frumps, the most dejected of misery sitting on doorsteps, drink their downfall, do the same. Can't be dealt with, she felt positive, by acts of parliament for that very reason. They love life. In people's eyes, in the swing, tramp, trudge, in the bellow and the uproar, the carriages, motor cars, omnibuses, vans, sandwichmen shuffling and swinging, brass bands, barrel organs, and the trump and the jingle and the strange high singing of some aeroplane overhead was what she loved. Life. London. This moment of June. And you see just from that short, brief example, you know, how detailed it is. And this is what the character is experiencing just simply as she goes to cross the street. All right, now we're going to move on to post-impressionism. Now, post-impressionism developed out of impressionism. It was not a reaction to it, but it developed from it. And what the post-impressionists were trying to do was they were actually more concerned more about the formal language of arts and, again, its ability to capture sensory experience. And what we're going to see, post-impressionism gets a little tricky because many of the post-impressionist artists try to add more formalistic into impressionism, but they all did this in a very different way. So we see it as involved from Impressionism because, again, it developed in the 1880s and 1890s, and it usually involved the same subject matter. And again, it was concerned more about formal language of art and its ability to capture sensory experience. We're going to see very vivid colors in some of the works. Some of them we're going to see a thick application of paint, especially when we get to Van Gogh. That's the work in the upper left here. However, again, how these different artists tried to show or put more structure into the Impressionistic works is what makes them very different. So again, they maintain the idea of art for art's sake. However, they wanted to move beyond the Romantic and the Impressionist view of the world of pure sensation. Many times you're going to see emphasized geometric forms within them. And also, most post-impressionists, we're going to see this flattening of the canvas, where works are going to become much more two-dimensional. Many of the post-impressionist artists saw painting as a flat surface carefully composed of shapes, line, and color. And again, they, recalled for, they called for a return to form and structure in painting. And here we're going to look at this painting. This is Georges Seurat, 1859 to 1891. This is a Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grande Jatte, 1884 to 1886, oil on canvas. And this is a very large work. Now we looked at this work at the very beginning of the lecture with the What is Art section. And how Seurat tries to add um, more formalistic qualities to his work is he creates his work through what's called pointillism. And this is where he very, very carefully applies paint one dot at a time with the paint on the very point of the brush. 
what happens in this is you get a very accurate description of light and color. And attention to perspective, he does play, pay attention to perspective, but it avoids making the work totally three-dimensional. So here we understand from atmospheric perspective, the things in the back are further away from us, the people in the front are supposed to be closer, yet there's still this kind of flattening of the canvas here. Now, the clip I have for you, this work was very famously used in the movie Ferris, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And the reason I have this little clip here is because Cameron, one of the characters, kind of becomes mesmerized with the small girl in the dead center in the white. And they keep flashing to Cameron to him, to Cameron to her. And what you see as they get closer and closer, you can see this application of the tiny little dots. Again, as in the works in Impressionism, here there are no color, solid color fields. Everything is made up of this tiny, tiny little dots. All right. Next, we have Paul Cezanne, 1831 to 1906. And Cezanne is very important, not only for the post-impressionists, but for our next section, because Cezanne is actually considered the father of modern art. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to use geometric shapes and outlining. In impressionistic works, you would see absolutely no outlining. And what he believed, though, was that the shapes show the underlying forms found in nature. And that by focusing on these shapes, that's how we find true harmony and balance in work. There's a strong sense of two-dimensionality throughout the works. And you can look at this. So this one is Mount St. Victoria. He has a series of these. This is 1887 oil on canvas. Now this is landscapes like we've seen before. However, what makes this different is look especially in the pastures and in the homes. He breaks these down to almost geometric shapes. You can see triangles and rectangles throughout it. And that's what he was trying to do in the work. Break it down to its basic geometric form. And again, that's going to be very important for the modernist modern art movement, especially cubism. All right, next we have Paul Gauguin, and he was more of a symbolist, and he, what this means is he uses symbols to represent ideas, usually very religious within his works. He insisted on form, and he resisted, though, realistic effects. Here in works such as this one, this is the vision after the sermon, Oil on Canvas, 1888. Here you see that vibrant use of color, and you clearly see outlining returning to the work. Again, this also has that flattening of the canvas. And then the last artist we're going to look at, your textbook has Vincent van Gogh as a post-impressionistic artist, but he's honestly more of a transitional figure from post-impressionism into expressionism, which we will talk about next time. Um, what we see in Van Gogh is emotionalism is reflected by his personal life, including his struggles with mental illness. And that's why we'll see him more as an expressionist work. However, he's very interested in complementary colors. He believed they express the quiet and harmonious rural life. Again, we see clear brush strokes, much heavier than Seurat used in pointillism. And what you can see here again, that flattening of the canvas. But we'll talk more about Van Gogh um, in the next section. All right, now the last style we're going to look at in this chapter is Art Nouveau, which translates loosely to new art. This developed in the 1890s, um, the early 1890s into the 1900s. And it was launched by Victor Hurrah, um, his dates 1867 and 1947, who was a Belgian artist. And this actually grew out of the English arts and craft movement, and it was a response to the industrialization going on at the time, especially things such as the Eiffel Tower. Now, the Eiffel Tower, which was designed by Gustave Eiffel, and it was designed to represent the French industrial progress, and it opened in 1889. And actually, many people saw this. At the time it was built, it was 984 feet, and at the time, it was the tallest structure in the world. However, many Parisians considered it an eyesore and worried that the industrial influence it would have on art. And so what happens is a reaction to this industrialization, the Art Nouveau develops. The Art Nouveau strove to reflect modernism, but also tried to keep a pre-industrial sense of beauty. 
Art Nouveau shows a fascination with plant and animal life and with organic growth. And you're going to see oftentimes the use of organic forms and traditional materials what, such as stone and wood. Also, a lot of Art Nouveau has a Japanese influence in these curving lines. And this was first seen at the Paris Universal Exhibition of 1889. And then it spread throughout Europe. And the building we see here, this is an example of this. This is Antoni Godard's Casa Batillo, 1905-07, and it's in Barcelona, Spain. And you can see here, right, that we have the building, but there's this flowing structure to it. The curved lines, and then this almost organic shape. And then if you actually get a closer look, you're going to see in the detailing in the deck decoration, we're going to see plant life highlighted in this. And that again what the Art Nouveau was trying to do. Again, they were still trying to be modern, but they wanted to keep kind of those simple pre-industrial aspects to the works. All right, that is the end of this chapter.